Hi everybody. So this is a module I developed for the AUS and the American University of Soviet Nations and UNS OED Intensive Biosustainability Studies course. It's also used for the TANS International Youth Peace Ambassador Training Workshop. This module is called Disability Studies and the Situation of Disabled People. And it looks A at the academic field of disability studies, some of its concepts it's using, and then gives some examples of the situation of disabled people, indicating why indeed a disability studies field is needed. I will for now or not show you the video again. You saw how I look like. Now it's audio, so it doesn't take away the space. These are my students, this interdisciplinary student research team. There's a link. I urge you to go there. They're doing some cool stuff. This is their logo they designed. Even the PowerPoint template is designed by them. So it's just an amazing group working on all kinds of topics, as you will see in the next slide. Here you see my group in more overview. We cover many topics, as you can see, from A to W covering as different things like aging well, anticipated governance, artificial womb, autism, all the way down to synthetic biology, sport, sustainability, and water. Um, on the bottom left, um, on the bottom picture, the left one is Lucy Deep, my master student, and the right one in the picture is Bushra Abdullah. The middle picture on the right is Verdun Leopatra, who generated the logo for this group and the name points the name and the right Natalie Ball, a member of the group. And then the top picture, some of uh, in my backyard, you can see here uh, how many people were so far part of the group. Some even, some even join. Also, they are supervised by other people, simply because they want to be part of the group. And we have uh, Stephanie Montesanti, who uh, is an, as a postdoc, who is like co-facilitating with me to give some other um, knowledge to the group some other views and so this is really a slide for thanking my students i really think they are doing exceptional work many of them are undergraduate students actually most of them are undergraduate students some of them starting all the way back right in year one when they come out of high school and they do amazing work so i have to thank them So what is disability studies? According to Society for Disability Studies, disability studies challenges the views of disability as an individual deficit or defect that can be remedied solely through medical interventions or rehabilitation by experts and other service providers and explores models and theories that examine social, political, cultural, and economic factors that define disability and help determine personal and collective responses to differences. To say it in a different way, to bring in the ability part, disability studies investigates the cultural dynamic of disadvantaging people who do not fit ability expectation and experience ableism. Now the term ableism is very likely the concept within disability studies. Um, and there will be other modules and right, around ability studies and it's actually a term which is applicable to all kinds of groups and dynamics, social dynamics. But in short, the term ableism evolved from the disabled people rights movement in the United States and Britain during the 1960s and the 1970s. It questions ableism that privileges species typical abilities while labeling subspecies typical abilities as deficient, as impaired and often undesirable which then often accompanies by a disabilism, the lack of accommodation and enthusiasm for the needs of people and other biological structures who are seen to not, not to have certain abilities, the unwillingness to adapt to the needs of others. Ability privilege is part of the ableism setup. Ability privilege describes the advantage enjoyed by those who exhibit certain abilities and the unwillingness of these individuals to relinquish the advantage linked to the ability, especially with the reason that these are earned or birth-given advantages. 
Ability privilege manifests itself through structural and governmental perpetuated ability privilege, systemic conscious, along with individual or interpersonal forms of ability privilege. Similar with ability privilege is classified as earned or unearned constantly changes and is not only culturally constructed but exhibits an acceptance or rejection of different ability privileges also are one aspect that shape our culture. Now going back to how we talk, talked about ableism before and now look at that through the privilege language, the concept of ableism was developed by the disabled people rights movement to question species typical normative body ability expectation and the ability privileges, ability to work, to gain education, to be part of society, to have an identity, to be seen as citizen that come with a species typical body. Although they never use the term ability privilege in this concept, this, this content, this really um, one could say like that. And then disabledism conceptualized within this meaning of ability privilege suggests that the people will expect, with expected normative body abilities are not willing to give up their ability privileges. As stated before, there are four different forms of privileges. And now in regards to disabled people, the structural and governmental perpetuated ability privilege are evident in the use of legal terms such as reasonable accommodation and undue hardship that suggest that powerful social groups, including governments, employers, and educational institutions, are only willing to give up ability privileges they see as reasonable. In this, it mirrors reasonableness, which is seen, for example, to preserve male privileges in law against women. This is published this piece of an ability privilege, so if someone wants to have, I mean, the article, it's open access, can be downloaded, and then you find there, the reference 38. Now, what does disability studies really do? There's one thing, right, these are just some areas they cover. One is really to look at where does the disablement come from? Is this based on one's body, right, the medical model of disablement, or is this like the social environment, right? What and here, right, the second one is then, and this is medical model versus social model of the body, which most people are not be aware because we don't really use that terminology. And there really it is, how do we define the body? Is the body defined within a medical parameter, so disease, defect, deficiency, or is the body defined within a social parameter, like a variation, a difference? Right. So one thing what is important is what I coined a couple of years ago, self-identity security. Everyone should have the right to identify themselves as they see fit. Now, if someone wants to say, well, I really am having a medical issue and I really have a problem medical wise, that's fine. Right. I'm not there to tell someone how they have to think about themselves. However, if someone says, well, I'm not deficient, I am not missing something, I am not a disease, and we definitely have right their discourses around it, like deaf culture discourse, neurodiversity discourse, then it's up to the people to decide how they define themselves. It's not up to me right, to automatically label someone as patient and then accordingly um, look at, I mean, through that lens, uh, where, where the problem originates. Even if someone says, well, yes, I have a medical condition, the disablement still can be coming from the social parameter, right? Yeah, like, for example, leprosy, right? One would say, yeah, the body might have a medical issue and they might define themselves as such or not. It's up to them. But even if they do, right, I mean, the negative social treatment people with leprosy experience over time right, and throughout history. I mean, it's obviously a social disablement. This has nothing to do with, <coughs> right? So there's, a, of course, a linkage, and right? And so you can have a medical condition and, and experience social disablement. You can be a social body, right? So like in deaf culture, where you define yourself as a variation, and you can experience social disablement because we expect you to hear. And there can be. Right, of course, also the medical-medical combination that one has 
a medical issue like cancer and one experiences also a medical disablement. So there is in essence the combinations possible medical medical, medical social and social social. Now ability security I called also a couple of years ago and that is really that one can have a decent life independent of one's abilities. That it's really about um, okay even if I don't have like an IQ of 200, I still can, I mean, get a have a living wage, right, or an IQ of 100, or, right, I mean, you get the, the, the jest, right, it's really about, everyone has certain abilities, and they should, right, and if you have, and they, they should, it should not be that, I mean, you simply can't have a decent life if certain abilities are missing, that's, I mean, one should, right, it's just, um, right, there has to be a way that we can, right, whether you have legs or not, whether you can hear or not, whether you right, can see or not, there has to be a way. And in the other module around the meaning of health, and where I cover also right, other topics such as enhancement beyond the species, to be, we will see how important the ability security aspect will be. So, the just we started, it really looks at the dynamic of species typical normatization and normalization. Now, as a disability studies scholar, right, being in disability studies academic field, it's important what do my do people I'm supposed to serve think? What do disabled people think disability studies should do? We published this in this piece, um, which um, was very evident, um, uh, and I will now highlight in the next couple of slides some of the demands disabled people have from the academic fields. Uh, demands I think we are not meeting, unfortunately. So here we have um, right, some of the expectations from disabled people. Work closely with all stakeholders in the area and undertake research which can provide an evidence base for addressing relevant policy and practice challenge. Should undertake research on relevant topics to increase knowledge and understanding of the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities and right, of Persons with Disabilities and a human rights-based approach to disability and, the de and to develop tools for development, programming, and planning. Monitor the CRPD. Provide evidence for effective, inclusive practices in development slash research. Include disability as a topic in relevant study courses. Develop, organize, and monitor specific study courses, for example, in rehabilitation and professions and inclusive education. To research, publish, and interrogate reliable data on disability and ensure that it is dissemination to inform policy and programs at uh, an appropriate level. To conduct action research to highlight and develop efficient tools and methods to accelerate disability inclusive policies and practices. To harmonize efforts towards improved data collection methods and systems. Teach universal design. To enable capacity building and awareness raising throughout society. Encourage awareness and disability studies at schools, universities and other educational institutions. Support students with disabilities. Push for disability inclusive educational institutions. They are also very, very clear what they want from the institution, not just from the disability studies scholar and program. Become disability inclusive institutions so all students can access sources of education. Provide disability awareness in all curricula. Support research on disability. Ensure that all data is disaggregated by disability, ethnicity, age and gender. Conduct research to sharpen the tools of inclusive development. Create knowledge base on inclusive development both in policy and practice. Contribute to data collection method and systems. Research to enhance the access of persons with visual disabilities to affordable assistive devices and technologies. In terms of ways forward, opportunities for enriched and fulfilling lives with disabilities. We have inclusive pathways throughout the education system with effective support mechanisms and opportunities to excel. A partnership program with the business, council and private sectors to develop inclusive communities. Inclusive community within the education establishment themselves of, at all levels. Programs to develop disabled leaders. Make it real. Research institutions should undertake research on issues of persons with disabilities, research on technology and innovation, designing products and services accessible for all, training and sensitization on the rights of persons with disabilities across sectors. As I stated um, before, I think all these demands, which were in the last couple of slides, we fail. 
as academic institutions and as um, disability studies programs and disability studies scholars. Um, not necessarily, definitely on the behalf of disability uh, studies programs and scholars, not because we don't want to do things, but we are part of a bigger system and reality is disability studies programs have problems to be seen uh, right as real, as to be accepted by the establishment, to receive the funding they deserve and to really ask the questions they should ask as many of these questions just won't find funding. So I just give you now a couple of realities of disabled people um, my students worked on uh, to just, I mean, back up that it really a disability studies field is not some, well, well, I mean, some luxury. It really is needed. And let's start with social terms of health and disabled people. According to the WHO, social determinants of health are the circumstances in which people are born, grow up, live, work and age, as well as the systems put in place to deal with illness. These circumstances are in turn shaped by a wider set of forces, economic, social policies and politics. That piece is actually published um, by me, so when you go to my website, which I put also at the end, um, you can find this article it's, um, on my website. It should be open access, the article around the social terms of health and disabled people. The Public Health Agency of Canada lists the following social terms of health, income and social status, social support networks, education and literacy, employment, working conditions, social environments, physical environments, personal health practice and coping skills, health child development, biology and genetic endowment, health services, gender and culture, and obviously all of these are parameters, determinants which are impacting disabled people and disabled people have problems in their daily life with. It's another one also from Canada but it's slightly differently written. It's income and income distribution, education, unemployment and job security, employment and working conditions, early childhood development, food insecurity, housing, social exclusion, social safety network, health services, Aboriginal status, gender, race, and here disability actually shows up as <laughs> a social determinant, as a parameter. Um, now this is coming from my publication. You can see here the, um, the citation. If you go to my website, you find this there, or you just go in Google or Google Scholar, and that should be open access. And this table, in essence, looked at Google and Google Scholar hits one obtains with, for example, the phrase social terms of health and then various social groups like women, gender, disabled people, people with disabilities. And I use both because in some countries, in some places, disabled people are preferred and others people with disabilities than the poor, the South, indigenous people and patient. And you can see that when you have social terms of health, yeah, it's 193,000 hits, right, and 100%. And then we have the different groups and 70% of the articles mention the term patient. And then it goes to women is 45%, gender is 32%. And then how they use the term disabled people or people with disabilities is 1.8 and 3.8%, right, the poor. And then indigenous people also around 3.7%. And that's in essence goes here throughout the tables. Um, that's whether we're looking, for example, social determinants and education, and then with, with again different social groups, or we look at social determinants and social status, again with, so throughout, disabled people, people with disabilities and indigenous people are the least mentioned groups in around, in Google, Google and Google Scholar, around social determinants of health, highlighting a huge bias what is covered. I mean, the patient is used, but a lot, what, what Right, so by showing that patient is so prevalent, you simply assume a medical model of the body because that's what a patient is. So it totally ignores that, I mean, someone who sees themselves not as a medical problem, like someone with deaf culture or a neurodiverse person, still has no income. And that is, but the person should still be covered under the social determinants of health. 
because it's not just, I mean, if we're looking at the WHO, right? I mean, the original 1948 definition is not just about absence of disease, right? And these people still have these problems, but totally not mentioned, that's a reality. Now let's go to employment. This is just, I mean, um, a table which shows like, right, um, how we define people. And this is because we often look at, I mean, right, different severity, so-called severity groups, right? And here is if answers at least one of these questions was unable, they are assigned to the very severe group. And that is later on very important. So, right, so can you actually not see, like for example, without glasses, or if you're blind, hearing would be the deaf person. Can you have difficulty walking or climbing stairs? That would be a wheelchair user. Do you have difficulty remembering or concentrating? That could be what we might, might put on a learning disability. Do you have difficulty with self-care, washing or over dressing? And then because of a physical, mental, or emotional health condition, do you have difficulty communicating, for example, understanding and being understood by others? That could be, for example, what we would call autism spectrum, right? Or uh, in essence, mental health issues, or kind of stuff. So. If any one of them works, you're already part of the severe group. Please keep that in mind. So this is then the job statistics in Canada from 2001. Employed, unemployed, not active. Again, this is very important. We often hear only about the unemployed number, and that's really irrelevant because most of the time, the highest number of this, right, what we call disabled people is really not even looking for work. And so you're right, the number who is really employed that is really uh, much more important um, to look at, right? Um, so, right, so none is 78% means you have no disability. Mild is 70%, moderate 47, severe 25, very severe. Now, here you can also see that there's obviously a problem with the definitions. When, when you go back to this one slide, you will see right, that the very severe was like, you can't go up the stairs, you can't, I mean, see, you can't, so this is all very severe, and the number here is, in essence, 0% employed, so if you're in a wheelchair, you're not employed, so the numbers are really problematic, and that, when you look, I look, I mean, right, there is definitely a long-standing complaint that the numbers we even find don't make sense, it's, Right, so even if you're the severe, I mean, it's clear that disabled people are not highly employed, but 0% given the severity um, scale, I don't think so. Um, so one has to keep that in mind. This is now from the US, and this talks about disability. I just put this in to showcase there is a problem with employment. Right. Also, we right now besides that we have a problem with what we label where. This is now without going in differences. This is just disability, and you can see the participation rate. This is the important part, right? Of person with disabilities, January 2014 and January 2015 is 18.2 or 19.6 percent. So with other employment number is 19.6 in January 2015, where 68.2 percent of the society. If you would just use look at unemployment number, it would be only 11.9%. People say, oh, yeah, versus 5.9%. Yeah, they're not as much employed, but 11.9, not that bad. But the real thing is how many people look for work. And that is much less. They don't even go, right? Because you have to look for work in order to be counted as unemployed. So with other words, really only 19.6% work. So 80% don't work. That's the real number, that's the US. And that is not much different, I would say, in many countries. Um, so, and if we then go for full-time job versus part-time jobs, versus very likely numbers will be even worse. So that is another reality, isn't it? Now here we have one from China. That one would suggest that, I mean, right, 24.8% 20, of the very severe are employed, right? 4.2% are unemployed. The numbers that the inactive one, that the, many of them inactive mean they don't even look for work, that seems to make sense. But whether for right, I mean, whether now the very severe really have, I mean, 24.8% employed. Again, we would have to see what do they mean with severe, um, right? Whether it's moderate and so on. And where would mental health, for example, fit and so on. So that's a problem. The numbers, I mean, also 
the reality is that very few are employed disabled people, but one really has one really needs a much better disaggregation for for what body structure we're talking about and what ability differences we're talking about and so on. Otherwise, we, besides just saying, well, it's a really bad situation, we can't really say much. I don't think deaf, blind, wheelchair users, mental health people, um, and so on, uh, neurodiverse people, deaf, I have all the same numbers and I ch face the same challenges because our accommodations are simply different. Now let's look at the post-2015 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we looked at that, it's the same paper we show, I showed before, which I mean, were in essence highlighting what people felt the disability studies field should do in academics. And we looked through that and the study found that disabled people were barely visible to invisible in the SD literature covered, that the goals and actions proposed in the SD discourses are of high relevance to disabled people, but that these discussions have generally not been explicitly linked to disabled people. It found that disabled people have clear ideas why they are invisible, what the problems with development policies are, and what needs to happen to rectify the problems. It found also that there was a lack of visibility of various as the areas and goals within the disability discourse. This comes from the abstract. This paper is open access, so you can download it and read this in more detail. Before the post-2015 development goals, sustainable development goals were the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. They covered Write these eight goals, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, achieve universal primary education, promote gender equality and empower women, reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria and other diseases, ensure environmental sustainability and develop a global partnership for development. Um, the last, the paper I just showed, um, right, by my students and myself about the uh, post 2015 covers also the reality around the MDG showing right data on that really disabled people like disabled people international question for a long time the invisibility also in this process and no indicator that was looked at how it whether it fits really disabled people these eight right how they get progress there and also um, the MDG reports normally never covered disabled people because of that, they were just not part of it. Disease of preparedness is another area. Right, UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities says in Article 11, Situation of Risk and Humanitarian Emergencies, state parties shall take in according with the obligation under international law, including international humanitarian law and international human rights law, all necessary measures to ensure the protection and safety of persons with disabilities in situation of risk, including situation of armed conflict, humanitarian emergencies, and the occurrence of natural disaster. Here's in essence a quote from Marcy Roth of the Spinal Cord Injury Association testifying before Congress of the US in regards to the Katrina disaster, which they had, which was a hurricane in the south of the US. And in essence, it really says, Susan Daniels called me to enlist my help because her sister-in-law, a quadriplegic woman in New Orleans, had been unsuccessfully trying to evacuate the soup to the Superdome for two days. It was clear that this woman, Benilda Kaixeta, was not being evacuated. I stayed on the phone with Benilda for the most part of the day. She kept telling me that she'll be calling for a ride to the Superdome since Saturday, but despite promises, no one came. The very same paratransit system that people can't rely on in good weather is what was being relied on in the evacuation. I was on the phone when Benilda, when she told me with panic in her voice, the water is rushing in and then her phone went dead. We learned five days later that she had been found in her apartment dead, floating next to her wheelchair. Right? Benilda did not have to drown. Hurricane Katrina is but one example of how disabled people are neglected in a disaster. There are many others, um, literature-wise. Right, disabled people were also disproportionately impacted in other disasters, such as the 1995 Great Henshin earthquake in Japan, or the 23 heat waves in France, where 63% of heat-related deaths occurred in institutions, with a quarter of these in nursing homes. A review of 18 U.S. heat wave response plans revealed that also people with mental or chronic illnesses and the homeless constitute a significant proportion of the victims in recent heat waves. Only one plan emphasizes outreach to disabled persons, and only two address the shelter and water needs of the homeless. I recently published a piece uh, around the, the process in after the disaster in Haiti, 
it's online again on my website and it's also open access so let me now come to water and sanitation more than 1 billion people in the world lack access to clean water and 2.6 billion to sanitation right halving the numbers was a mdg goal according to the um defense i mean dfid research project description it really is only one it's one it's one project on the uk agency is the only one where we can have numbers for disabled people which then says that 60 million physically disabled people have difficulties relating to water supply use and sanitation in essence we don't have numbers again a, a common problem um, we published a variety of papers around water and sanitation i think they're all open access um yeah they're all open access so you can have a, a look at them Right. The 2002 General Commons Number 15 of the United Nations Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights states: "The human right to water entitles everyone to sufficient, safe, acceptable, physical, accessible, and affordable water for personal and domestic uses. An adequate amount of safe water is necessary to prevent death from dehydration, reduce the risk of water-related diseases, and provide for consumption, cooking, personal, and domestic hygiene requirements." The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Article 28, Adequate Standard of Living and Social Protection says, to ensure equal, equal access by persons with disability to clean water services and to do, ensure access to appropriate and affordable services, devices and other assistance for disability-related needs. In essence, a requirement. According to Well, the Resource Center for Water Sanitation and Environmental Health, Disabled people should be considered in the water and sanitation discourse because disabled people are among the poorest, most vulnerable and marginalized groups in society. Development targets for water and sanitation will never be equitable met unless disabled people's needs are included. The biggest problem for disabled people are obstacles in the environment, not their own impairment. Water and sanitation providers have a key role in, phys in reducing physical and infrastructural barriers in the environment. Disabled people often need only minor changes to be made to enable them to be included in ordinary water and sanitation service provisions. Specialist skills and knowledge are therefore not required. Making water and sanitation facilities more accessible benefits everyone in the community, such as the elderly and those are ill. Here is from a briefing note on including disabled people in sanitation and hygiene services produced by the SHARE Consortium and the organization WaterAid which states the barriers that disabled people face when using sanitation facilities have been categorized as environmental, such as steps and narrow doors, institutional, such as lack of information from authorities and inclusion from consultative procedures, and attitudinal, such as prejudicial attitudes from the community and service providers. Right. Various documents from the WEDC, WaterAid, and others highlight the needs of disabled people and possible solutions in countries like Nepal, Mali, Ethiopia, Cambodia, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Sri Lanka, Ghana, Zambia, Malawi, and so on and so on and so on. However, although there are organizations who work on it, they are rather the exception to the rule. WaterWiki, for example, has over 170 hits for the term women and gender, but only six hits for the term disabled, five for the term disability, which is mostly about a disease-borne uh, linkage. For most concepts covered in the water discourse, security, access, equity, equity, equality, the combination with gender generates 100 to 200 fold more hits than the combination with people with disabilities or disabled people. Furthermore, medical terms such as patient and disease are much more visible than the terms people with disabilities or disabled people, hinting at a very medical angle of the water discourse. Indeed, it's much more common to hear about water and disabled people in the context of unclean water and lack of sanitation, generating impairments and disease. For example, the Center on Housing Rights and Eviction Corps. Yeah. Then, and some others, then in the context of lack of access. If one searches these leading policy documents on water, you can see the, the right, WHO 2009 and so on, for the term disability, what shows up is the term disability adjusted life years or nothing. So purely medical understanding of disability and mostly how, we, how something is generating impairment. This paper is accessible, it's open access, so you can download this for more details on it. 
The United Nations World Water Development Report 4, in all three volumes, one, two, three, covered women, and by 366 times, indigenous people, 19 times poor, 420 poverty, 234 rural, 247 access, 735 times. So this, the short term this app that catches, among others, the terms disabled people, people with disability, people with disabilities, disability, disabilities, showed up eight times on 835 pages with every single incident linked to the concept disability adjusted life years, which in essence means that we are generating impairments and what the problem with that is. Again, the same paper, open access. This quote from the third edition of the World Water Report is indicative of the invisibility of disabled people in the water and sanitation discourse. Those who suffer the most usually have the least to start with, indigenous people, women in developing countries, the world poor and their children. Disabled people are not mentioned. And indeed, the World Water Report, which is supposed to be written in, right under the header of UNESCO, with, in essence, all kind of other agencies helping them, from the beginning totally ignores disabled people and how it relates to um, them, despite that they mention other marginalized groups. Um, but disabled people are not. And it's not, and they were told, they were told right from day one when the first report came out that this is a deficiency, that it's missing, and they so far haven't acted. They simply ignored it, and so, yeah, well, that's another reality. Now, my students did a survey ascertaining which social groups are seen as experiencing water and sanitation insecurity in high and low-income countries. Interestingly, as to high-income countries, the survey found that indigenous and ethnic minorities were seen as facing higher insecurity than disabled people. This one is also open access. You should be able to download this. Now, the interesting part here is that it's obviously not a reality. Um, definitely, as a wheelchair user, most washrooms are still inaccessible. Um, in, in Canada, we have two YouTube videos online. The first one shows that I mean, right, that even though, and that's a problem, the ones, a lot of washrooms have wheelchair accessible signs on it, but that has no correlation with that they're really wheelchair accessible. Um, so you might want to look also at the YouTube video. You can find this online. We have only two YouTubes, I think, on, on our website of, of publications um, from Berlin Leopatra done. The second one is really looking into then um, more Right, uh, non-Calgary content around water and sanitation access, um, also very good. Um, again, Whirling was the second year undergraduate when she did this work in these videos. But yeah, the, the, and I think that this misunderstanding or that people really think that disabled people have more access than ethnic minorities or indigenous people. It's really a reflection on, I think, that, we, that the wheelchair sign is on a lot of washroom doors and some people saying, oh, we address that, we identified that there's a problem and we fixed it. Unfortunately, this is not the reality. And this concludes this module on disability studies and the reality disabled people face. I hope uh, it was, of, uh, was informative and of interest to you. Uh, if you have any questions, you can, of course, email me. Um, a lot of the papers are online, are open access, so you can have access, you can read them. So I hope, um, and when you have more questions based on that, you, I'm, I'm also more than happy to get email questions, which I will answer and so on. So thank you for um, looking, listening, watching this module, and have a nice day.